lemons, oranges, grapefruit, limes. Those are all pretty basic species of citrus that we commonly use and consume in our day-to-day -day lives without giving it much thought. But what if I told you that we wouldn't have lemons if we didn't have pomelos? And that grapefruits come from oranges that we wouldn't have without mandarins? What do you think now? Are you getting interested in the world of citrus? Winter is citrus season. Even though fruits of many species and varieties are available all year long, late fall to late spring is truly the peak season. So this is a perfect time to look a bit closer at them, whether it's to explore their intriguing morphology or the complicated taxonomic relationships amongst them. So what we're really after when we're consuming a citrus fruit is its pulp or juice. In fact, the pulp consists of many small sacs called juice vesicles. They're pretty consistent in shape, mostly elliptical, and with a short stalk that attaches them to the membrane. In some citrus, such as pomelo, the vesicles come apart really easily and they almost seem to fall out of the fruit when you open it. In others, such as lemon, you have to work much harder to isolate an individual vesicle. And have you heard of a caviar lime? This Australian species got its common name because of its round juice vesicles that are reminiscent of real caviar. Let me know if you've ever tasted it, because I personally learned about it just recently. The juice vesicles are arranged within segments in a citrus fruit. These segments are clearly defined by membranes. While the pulp is juicy, sweet and pleasant to eat, the membranes can ruin the citrus taste with their bitterness, so you might want to remove them before eating. In some citrus, the membranes are super thin and without much taste, but in others, like a pomelo, the membranes can be thick, leathery and almost unchewable. The number of segments per fruit varies by species, although it's not set, and there is some variation within the species as well, but each has a distinct range. It also tends to correlate with the size of the fruit. To illustrate this, kumquats, the smallest citrus, have only four segments, while in pomelos, the largest citrus, you can count up to 18 segments. The number of segments is given by the number of locules in the female reproductive part of the flower. The locules are located in the ovary, whose walls develop into a three-layered pericarp. The pericarp layers in a citrus fruit are clearly visible. The endocarp layer is the innermost layer that immediately surrounds the seed. That's basically our citrus pulp, the juice vesicles. The mesocarp is the white tissue between the pulp and the rind, and it might also be referred to as albedo. Albedo is packed with fiber, namely pectin, which has jellifying properties, and commercially produced pectin, that you might use when making gems or marmalades, comes straight from this part of the citrus fruit. Finally, the outermost layer, usually a brightly colored rind, is the exocarp, and in citrus it's called flavido. Those dots in the rind are oil glands, which is where the distinct citrus aroma comes from. You can see them both in a cross section of the fruit, but also just on the surface. So this was a basic morphology of a citrus fruit, which I should mention is classified as a modified berry, called a Hesperidium. Now onto the relationships amongst various citrus, because that's where it gets interesting. Species of citrus and its related genera have high sexual compatibility amongst each other, so they hybridize very readily. Hybridization and mutation are both very common in citrus, whether they're naturally occurring or they're initiated by humans in order to cultivate various citrus fruits. This, along with frequent clonal propagation, has led to the citrus genus consisting of many hybrids, cultivars, varieties and subspecies. The naming itself is often inconsistent, and synonyms, multiple names for the same plant, are common. To put it simply, citrus taxonomy is a bit of a complicated mess. Before DNA sampling and genomic work, scientists had to rely mainly on morphological characters and geographical distribution to create classification systems. There have been many scientists who contributed to the organization of citrus taxa, but 
two famous concepts for citrus classification are well known and still widely referred to, Tanakas and Swingles. Oddly enough, but proving the point of citrus being problematic, Swingles' system recognizes only 16 citrus species, while Tanaka, in his latest work, used 162 species. The significant reduction in the number of species comes mainly from recognizing varieties and hybrids as such, instead of classifying them as a whole separate species. With the advances in science and use of genomic data, the picture of the relationships between and within citrus and related genera gets more clear and we can see, for example, that seemingly different looking individuals are more closely related to each other than those that look quite similar, and vice versa. One of the examples would be kumquats, which got moved from their own genus, Fortunella, to the genus Citrus. It probably won't surprise you, though, that even this change is being disputed by some. I could talk about the history of a citrus taxonomy for a very long time, so just know that this is a very simplified brief summary just to give you an idea how complicated citrus taxonomy is. A major genomic study from 2018 identified the 10 citrus progenitors, meaning species from which all the other citrus descended. Seven of these are from Southeast Asia and three are Australian. However, the previously mentioned study revealed that the origin of those Australian species traces back to Southeast Asia as well, and they got dispersed to Australia from there. Three of those progenitors are the ancestors of the majority of commercially grown citrus species and are often referred to as core or fundamental species. Note that even this system continues to be challenged, but the idea of the core species seems to be generally agreed upon. It actually surprised me that the pomelo, the largest citrus fruit, is an ancestral species and not some fancy hybrid. In fact, it's thanks to the pomelo, which some of you may never heard of, that we have the much more common lemons, limes, oranges, or even grapefruits. Similarly, based on the look, I would have labeled a lemon a progenitor over a finger lime that looks just too man-made. Of course, the fruits that we eat and grow today probably look quite different from their wild ancestors, but still. So let's look at some of the popular citrus fruits and learn where they came from. Oranges account for the majority of citrus production worldwide. Blood oranges, navel oranges and Valencia oranges are probably the most well-known of the many orange cultivars and varieties available on the market. Orange, citrus hybrid species sinensis, is a hybrid between two of our core species, pomelo, citrus maxima, and mandarin, citrus reticulata. Orange, crossed with pomelo, gave rise to grapefruit, citrus hybrid species paradisi. Lemons, as basic as they seem, are a hybrid between citron, citrus medica, again one of our core species, and another hybrid, bitter orange, citrus hybrid species orantium. Key limes, the main component of the famous key lime pie, are a hybrid between citron, citrus medica, and another lime, kaffir lime, citrus hystrix, which is that unusual-looking green bumpy lime. If we take key lime and cross it with lemon, we in turn get a Persian lime, citrus hybrid species latifolia, which is the most commonly grown commercial lime and the one you're probably most familiar with. These are just a few examples of the most commonly known citrus to give you an idea about their tangled interrelationships. I hope that next time you eat a grapefruit or squeeze some lemons, you not only look closely at their intriguing anatomy, but you also think about their complicated history and all their ancestors, and you'll never take any citrus for granted. Let me know in the comments below if you learned something new in today's video. And if you don't want to miss any future videos, please make sure you subscribe to this channel. Big thank you goes to my patrons who continuously support my work over on Patreon. If you'd like to support me as well, please consider joining Nature Clearly Patreon or newly become a YouTube member. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.